another episode here of Getting There with Goss. But before we talk about our guest and why we're live on location for a second time, I want to tell you about our friends over at Mohawk Honda. So proud to have Godzilla Media partnering with Mohawk Honda. If you're stopping in there, you're looking for a new vehicle in the Capital Region, say hello to my guy Cam McKenna. Say hello to Greg and, and Andy Gelcher. Don't forget Brian McKenna because he gets salty if you only say his kid's name. It's only – it hasn't been so <laughs> – LeVac, my pal, you tuned into this. LeVac, you tell us. You, you take over the library. Tell us about the great people at Mohawk Honda. Listen, you might be hearing rumors that the 2021s aren't on the lot at Mohawk Honda, Freemans Ridge Road in Scotia, but that's not true. They are there, and they are ready for you, and our boy John is over in service to take care of you. Uh, listen, you know we love Mohawk families, both of us, Mohawk families, and um, just – Beautiful vehicles, great dealership. You know, Jeff, Steve, Harridan, you know, Andy Gelcher, the whole crew. I got to drop my vehicle off at John at service. What'd you do now? Uh, Was it, it a bear in a shopping cart? It just cart? says maintenance. It just says maintenance. <laughs> I texted John and Cam. I'm like, it just says maintenance. I don't know. There's also goldfish in the back seat. I feel like I need to clean those up. For <laughs> you, you know guys. what that is. Your car, your, your beautiful Honda Pilot went, I could explain this to you, but you wouldn't understand. <laughs> Like, I could say you need airing your tires. You wouldn't under... I could tell you your windshield wiper fluid is low. You wouldn't... Maintenance. Just please bring me somewhere that someone will take care of me. It's me hitting my car like an ape. <laughs> fix, <laughs> fix, <laughs> fix. <laughs> How do we get the files on this computer? More <laughs> reasons to go to Mohawk Honda right there in Scotia. <laughs> Wherever you're listening, stop into the Capital Region. Find out the great people that Levac and I love. Let's get into it. We don't need another introduction. It is getting there with Goss, but I'll do it one more time. You've heard the voice of Levac. They're Jeff Levac, <laughs> Capital Region. Can we call you I'm not Cap- used to you talking first. That's what it's freaking me out. I don't like strange. it. <laughs> At some point, if you want to take over and take the lead of getting there with Goss, I won't stop you. Uh, I don't know if you've listened to any of these podcasts, but it's going to be more about your career, and we'll see where the rest of it goes. If you just heard Levac, that's a nice uh, sip of a beer we're going to be enjoying. This. <laughs> that's the big thing in podcasts. You have to be drinking during the podcast. Yeah. Heard. Well, I mean, because I don't have FCC regulations, right. and I drank when I did. So, because, like, if I'm not mistaken, the rule is whoever's actually running the board cannot drink. So I never did that. Never. Wink, wink. Wink, wink. No, no, say them all. Uh, six, seven, eight years old, Jeff LeVac. When you were a kid, what did you want to be as a kid? It was the same dream job. Homicidal maniac. Uh, <laughs> when you were 18, yeah. it was legal to commit murder. Um, you know, I, it was, it's weird. Dad was a mechanic. He ran the Niskina school bus garage. So I always thought I wanted to do that. Uh, but he he told me I wasn't allowed to. He's like, I want you to work smarter, not harder. Uh, and there was a point where I wanted to be a firefighter. And then there was a long part of my life where I had no bleeping clue what I wanted to do. I had no idea at all. And that, that might still be the case, if we're being perfectly <laughs> honest. But when you are 18, South yeah. Colony, shout yeah. out, right? What up? Mean Streets of the South, Colony. They, they tell you you have to leave. <laughs> uh, college is sort of not your route, but kind of is. Like, are you so like I knew I was going. Area? I knew I was going to Hudson Valley. Okay, but this is before all that. So I, I actually at one point, I really, really wanted to be an athlete. I really wanted to be like I wanted to, and and I've always had some kind of physical skill and gift, but I've always been. I can swear, right? Yeah. Do we go with F-moms? Is that allowed? You can or? do whatever you want now in podcast uh, land. I know, but like it's your show. I don't want like you might have a line like, "Hey, anything but an F-bomb." I say for this. For this, you can drop F-bombs right. if you want. By the way, Mohawk Honda, this is only because of LeVac. Well, and I'll only say it. I'll only do it once, but it's, okay. it, 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 I think it's needed. I was such a fuck-up. I was so, <laughs> like, I I could take the brightest, sunniest day and turn it into a tornado. That I, like, drank my way out of playing certain things, everything. But as I got through, you know, later in uh, to high school, junior, senior year, I, I was actually relatively intelligent. Like I, So I wanted to do um, sports medicine. So I went to Hudson Valley on a biology major, and I took the uh, I didn't take the SATs because you have to take an entrance exam to go to Hudson Valley. So I was like, why am I going to take two tests? Like it's stupid. I'll take that. I scored so high on the math part that they literally wrote on my college entrance exam, like this is great work! Exclamation mark! Like what you do on a kid's test, not like an entrance exam. Problem is, I'm not that smart, and I screwed that up. <laughs> and I started cooking over at Treason House, and that's when I went to Schenectady County Community College to cook. Okay, so hang on. So yeah. you go to Hudson Valley. And yeah. You left this part out, and yeah. you're being a little humble here at the start. You were a very good athlete who came to lacrosse, too. And as you mentioned, we'll just leave it there. Uh, you had partaken in too many extracurricular activities with a certain I got drink. suspended for over a week for drinking on school grounds and getting okay. caught. Yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> yes, that's, that's what happened. A, and, that, and when I came back to school, the lacrosse coach was waiting for me. Because he's like, well, since you're not allowed to play football, <laughs> how about some lacrosse? And I played goalie on the um, – on the JV team right away, 
And uh, it, it's, I love it. It's fun. It's a great thing, but it's also a, extremely painful. And it was like, it was like random games where people would laugh. You know what I mean? Like, like, uh, like teammates would laugh. Cause I'd be getting, I'd, I looked like I was polka dotted by the time I got on the bus and I just got ticked off. I, you know, went through the season. We, we weren't very good. And then I just decided not to do it anymore. I, I it, it was stupid. Cause I would, I was getting sniffs from some college programs where they were like, Hey, we'd like to talk to you at some point. And that was already, I wasn't even playing varsity at that point, but yeah, I, I chose I, I chose my path early. It was it was in one of these bottles. <laughs> well, let, let's go back to Hudson Valley because you test so well there. But yeah. you flip over to cooking. Your intention when you went to Hudson Valley, you just didn't know what you wanted to do, and then you like where does cooking come from out of the blue? Oh, I, well, so I was I was in high school. I started working at Treasure House Nursing Home. Okay, and that's run by Marriott at the time, Sadeo Marriott, and I started cooking on the weekends and doing stuff, and I I was I was good. I was pretty good at it. So the the chef at the time, and I won't say his name. We'll just call him um, uh, D Bag Mick Douchey Face. Um, <laughs> he, he would he would beat me down, but he'd teach me a bunch of cool stuff. So he's the one who pushed me towards going to school for it. And uh, at uh, Trees Now Central would actually pay for like one or two courses a semester. So I would take you know two courses a semester in my spare time and got pretty good. Was actually in the chef's guild at like eighteen years old, and then. Uh, was not. <laughs> so what happened? Because you are good. You're excelling. You're wearing the full. I joked around because I've seen these pictures with you before. And this is the weird part about doing this because we've had these conversations privately. Right. And now doing this publicly with you listening wherever it might be on Apple or Spotify. You had the full wardrobe. You're doing it. This. Yeah. What, what, what's the change here? Um, I won tickets from Uncle Vito on Picks 106 for the WWE. And remember, this is the funny part. Cause all, like I used to mock you so bad on Levac and guys about being a wrestling fan. And the the bottom line is, and the bottom line is, wrestling's what got my radio career started. I won by doing voices, wrestling voices. I won tickets, and when I went to pick them up, I met Nikki Sear, who is now Nikki Polisek. She was the marketing director for Picks, and I was like, she's like, "What do you do?" I go, "I want to do this," and they were like, "Oh, you want to do live on location? You want to hang banners? You want to?" I'm like, "No, I want to be on the radio." They're like, "Oh, then go to new school," <laughs> <laughs> and. And I did, and um, I got I interned at Picks, and that was it. I've never had to find a job since. All right, so you interned at Picks. Who are you interning for at that point? Are you discouraged? Are you encouraged? Because internships can be so different in the radio field. I'm glad you bring this up because I heard the I heard the Wolf uh, getting there with guys uh, Bob Wolf one. I was I interned for Wolf Wolf and Mulrooney in the morning on Picks, and when I was an intern, Wolf was cool. Like he was he just left you alone. He let you do your thing. He thought Mulrooney was great. He would teach you stuff. Uh, Angry Steve Hayner, the phone guy. R.I.P. Brother, uh, you know there was there was a great crew. He, Mike the Enforcer, we were all there. He was great. As soon as I started drawing a paycheck, Wolf like turns into the diva that he could be, and that and that's and I don't think he'd have a problem with me saying that. And our 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 personalities did not mix. They just didn't mix. And and on one hand, I can see where he was coming from after doing this all this time. It's like who's this stupid kid who gets paid to go hang my banners? Who's talking smack to me? But on the other token, like he just a couple times, he just said a couple, just a little too far, and I just didn't want anything to do with him. Was it so much Wolf in particular, or do you think that was the era of radio in that area? We're talking like early '90s, right at that point. Where no, it's late. I okay. remember. I was, hell, man, I graduated high school in '94. <laughs> um, I started at Picks in '98, late '98. No, I was actually, I think it was like March of '98, and then I was, I, I worked there for like a year, and then we had the merger, and I ended up on the Edge, which was Stern in the morning. Okay, so that's interesting with that transition from intern to paycheck to on the air. Yeah. Because the timeline of that, although you said it quickly, for a lot of people's career, <laughs> it's not that quick. Like, what was the push that you went from intern? Was it as simple as, hey, I want a job? Because a lot of people yeah. might be in the spot in their career now where it's, I'm interning, I'm interning, or they're doing unpaid work, and they want to take that next step. What did you do to make that next step? I just, I, I never said no. You know what I mean? Like that was, I used to give this speech over at uh, new school. Uh, you just don't say no. If they need something done, you do it. I, I fit in. You know what I mean? Like I worked hard. I fit in. And, and um, angry Steve, uh, he, he was, he was like producer slash phone guy. And he loved me. We were boys like right away. So like I, we'd go to the bars, we'd do whatever we had to do. So when it came to the end of my internship, he like called over to the other office because at that point where it was called the bunker, it was over by uh, Niskina School Bus Garage, but they, everybody else was in Latham Circle Mall. He called over. He's like, "You can't let this kid leave." And they hired me. I did like I think I did like three events, maybe three, and then I get called into Doctor John's office. Doctor John Cooper was still over there, and I'm like, "Oh my god!" Like, 
like Coop has a reputation. He's a hard ass. Like you don't you don't mess with Coop. Like that's <laughs> that's the thing. And he goes and and in there is um, you know other people. But bottom line is, we like what you do. We're actually going to make you a salary employee. You're going to host events. So I if if the talent like if if Uncle Vito or Wolfer was out, I would go set that up. I'd hang the banners. I'd stand there and make sure it went well. If it was nighttime and it was you know Coors Light, I was hosting. And that was my show. I did that show for over a year for picks where it was, you know, I'm at the Rock in Troy getting loaded with everybody and getting my, my fiance at the time has to drive me home in the vehicle, which is amazing. <laughs> I'm still here. And when what really catapulted me forward and like, we're talking, we're talking like 18 K was the salary. So I was making like 25, 26 cooking and then an extra like couple hundred bucks doing radio. And I, I was like, nope. Good, I'm taking it. Give me the 18, I'll take it. Which even now people are like, 18 radio? How'd you get so much? <laughs> <laughs> but um, when the merger happened, so so Clear Channel now iHeart comes into town. You can only own so many, so much percentage of the of the market. So they wanted picks to add to their repertoire. They were going to give us QBK QBJ, which was the edge, and we got to keep GNA. So Bob Osfeld was the GM. Bob Osfeld said, "Stay with me. I'll take care of you. I'll give you a couple bucks." And you'll be on the air. And if Bob Oswald says it's good, the Bob Father, if you get blessed by the Bob Father, you do it. And that's what I did. Let's sit there with the Bob Father, Bob Oswald. For those who may not be familiar, especially in the Capitol region. New York, New York Broadcaster Hall of Famer, Bob Oswald. That's exactly right. Levesque beat me to it. We are talking about one of the true titans of the radio industry here in New York. You are a young person in your career developing a relationship with somebody who proves to be one of the most influential people. Again, not just in the Capitol region. We're talking all of New York State. What was your relationship like with him, and what was he like being a mentor for you early in your career? He's scary. Like, that dude was the Oz, like the almighty Oz. <laughs> um, but if, if he liked you, if you were respectful to him and he liked you, you were set. You were, it was, like, I literally had – I'm not – I don't – it's not right. Like, I wanted to say names because we're, we're sitting in my bar. Um, another really influential radio guy once said to me, he's like, well, you're one of Bob's, so you're fine. And it was like, a, it was like an insult. It was like, a, like well, you can get away with whatever you want. You're one of Bob's. And I was like, well, hold up. You know why I'm one of Bob's, right? Because I bust my ass. Like, like, you know what I mean? Right. But, but like, if you, if, if you were respectful and did what he needed you to do, and he saw talent in you, he saw promise in you, you'd never have a bigger champion. Like, he was the best. Like, and not just professionally. Professionally was amazing. Um, personally. So I'll start with professionally. Reverend Dave Hill becomes the program director of, of The Edge as soon as we take it over. And really smart dude he used to have this like long hair walked around in jesus sandals looked like jesus like literally and he was and he was an ordained minister so he was reverend dave hill bob tells me i'm on the air that's why i come over i meet him he goes yeah put a tape together we'll talk maybe i can find something for you maybe you know whatever it could take time I'm like and i'm like oh i just i screwed up like i screwed up i shouldn't have done it bob puts his arm around starts walking around turns back looks at me he goes i'll take care of it i'll take care of it Reverend Dave comes back to me like 15 minutes later. So, yeah, we're going to start you on the weekend, like 10 to 2 on Saturdays. And, uh, you know, we're going to teach you to board up Howard Stern. And, I, and that caused like a rift between Hill and I because, you know, here's this guy who came here who knows his stuff, who he had guys he wanted to bring in with him, and they were all really talented people. And then here's this, you know, snot-nosed punk who he has to take. He has no, And, I, of course, I don't understand that at the time. I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm where I belong. And it ended up working really, really well, but I could understand why. So that was like professionally, like if he told you his word was good, it was, it was better than good. Do you want to sit on the personal stuff too, before we move yeah, on? Yeah, I, I, I will. Um, so I meet the woman who's going to be my wife and I, I've always been, I don't like, I think some people always thought I was scamming. I would rather spend money with clients, even if they're not spending money with me directly. Like if, if a jewelry store is spending money, and you did this yourself, and this is why you have such a great relationship with, uh, I'll say it, Lillian David Fine Jewelers, Wilton Mall. Um, they, were, they were with me, and you were like, well, if they're spending money on, on our station, I'm going to go get my engagement ring and wedding bands there. So that's it. I went to Bob. I go, hey, I'm proposing, you know, whatever. Honestly, uh, she proposed to me, but you know, whatever. Um, but the I was Panga like, style, yeah, 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 absolutely. Right? I, yeah. Got to, I got to Panga. Uh, I, got, I got Jeff Meath World. Um, <laughs> and I was like, you know, I would rather spend the money with a client. He calls over to the jewelry store, tells them I'm coming. I walk in and, it, and you know, I'm, I'm in gym shorts, flip flops, hat backwards, pretty much the same way I still dress now. 
just a little skinnier. And you would have thought like I was the dude rolling in with like the black card. You know what I mean? They were just like, oh, Jeff in the back. Oh, come here. Oh. And they're like, like somebody's there and like pulls up in a Maserati, like stiff arm out of the chair. Get out of the way. Like, and and uh, they helped me, you know, help me get all my stuff, took care of it. And then when I ultimately ended up uh, getting a divorce from that same person, Bob was in my corner the whole time, made sure I kept my head above water. He didn't let my career suffer and, you know, would legitimately let me borrow money. It's fortunate that you're able to find people like that like bob in your career because when you're starting off in a career whatever it might be any type of field it's hard to find people oh. with look radio television newspapers there's ego filled people and i'm sure with no disrespect to bob why are you looking like, at me <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect to him, but like everyone has to kind of have their own backing but to have a guy like that in your corner throughout your career is amazing and to have a mentor like that is so influential for your career i think we for perspective here have to offer this because what you're going to find out about the podcast world is that people listening to this may have never listened to you before on 104.5 The Team, or <laughs> we're going to soon talk about your country career in rock. But I think for the sports fans who know you from 104.5 The Team, they're probably confused of why you're doing rock and not sports. Kind of offer up why it's the rock angle out of the gates rather than how some people may know you as a sports host. I never knew that I would be able to do sports. Talk. I never knew I'd be able to talk. You know, like I, I knew I was funny. I knew I was a one-liner kind of guy. Like I've always had confidence in that. But I didn't. If you had told me then, hey, at some point you're going to talk five hours a day about sports, I'd have been like, well, I kind of do that now. No, no, on the radio, and you're going to get paid for it. I'd be like, <laughs> what do you smoke? But it, Pix was Pix was a, a heritage station. I wanted to be on Pix, but I loved the Edge, Active Rock, and this was like the heyday of Active Rock. Like this was, you know, ninety nine to two thousand three, where. You know, Disturbed, Stain, Metallica is still cranking out hits. Godsmack is really hitting. And I was all about it. Like when I got, so it was like I was on, I wasn't on picks. I got to work at picks. I got, I screwed up really bad with Dr. John. And he came to me one day and he goes, Hey, I need somebody to do overnight on New Year's Eve. And I went, Oh, okay. Okay. And he's like, You don't want to? I'm like, Well, I, no, not really. He never offered me an air shift again because that was the deal. That was, I was my first shot. I should have jumped at it. I should have taken it. Um, and then I got over. I did the Stern thing. I did the Saturdays on the edge, and that's, that's where I started to take off Find My Voice at 7 to Midnight, stuff like that. But that was fun, and that's when I learned, you know, I learned how to do this in, in bursts. Like, you, this is such a different animal than what we did back then because you do a burst it was uh you you had to be entered you had to fit entertainment into under like i think i was allowed to talk for like a minute that was about it and that was even like once an hour the rest of the time it was like 30 seconds tops so you had to find you had to pry and, and make that entertaining now it's like all right i did a minute well I'll do 10 more because because <laughs> commercials are up in a little while and, and by the way it's a it's january so they ain't selling nothing yeah you mentioned that rock era from that late 90s to early 2000s, I think you said it really well there, that this is where everybody wants to be because oh. this is truly the golden era of this type of radio where if you are a male 20 to 54, that's where you're going. Sports talk radio, it's time is really still at its infancy. Like a lot of national shows haven't taken off yet. You have some local shows that are happening in sports. I think they're in the camp region. Just Roger might be hosting sports. I think Tobin and Coleman come later. Like there isn't a lot of sports opportunities but I do want to talk about the Howard there Stern wasn't, There wasn't a lot of people no. who were there – wasn't, there wasn't, I think there were people doing it, but there was a lot of notoriety. Yeah. Like, nobody knew – like, the way people knew who you and I were, like, still, like, to this point, like, we haven't – we just figured out a little while ago, we haven't done a show together since January. So it's like – and people still come up to me and go, how's God's? Like, whisper. Like, I'm like, he's – God's is good. You're like, whatever. Like, people are like, oh, God is good. No, God, oh, I don't – like, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Is it stranger than that or someone walking up to you say, are you Gaz from Levac and Gaz? <laughs> Kind, of the, kind the, of the only plus side the only plus side to to that show not being on right now is i don't get levac and gaz okay well, what's up levac like i'll get that where you feel levac and gaz it's like i'm just i know i'm fat but i'm one person <laughs> just me come on so howard stern I, i'm sure you've had oh. him described uh the same way he's been described to me by salespeople. it's truly he's been compared to jesus and what i mean by that <laughs> it's that pre-stern during stern mm -hmm. post stern like jesus right B, C, A, D, that's how salespeople describe the era and the influential 
positivity or negativity, depending on how you want to look at it, <laughs> of the Howard Stern era. And you were in it, LeVac. You were in the mix of it on a local level. Take us through what that meant to your career. And for those who are probably younger listening, what Howard Stern meant to the radio industry. Stern was the he was the best at getting to that line and and not always crossing it. I mean, he would cross it once in a while just so you knew he could. It's almost like like if you're going to pull a gun, you better shoot it kind of thing, where he would be like, I'm going to pull it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. to. And then every once in a while, he'd actually pull it. Um, but he would say things nobody else said. He would do things nobody else did. And he, in, like, in this modern-day cancel culture, I, I love everybody who listens to him now, and they're like, he doesn't sound like that. He couldn't do that show. He would, he'd, get, he'd get two shows done, and he'd be canceled. The, he did a show in, in, in blackface. Like, he did a whole TV show in blackface one time, and nobody talks about it. Like, every once in a while, it'll come up. Because he did it, like, with Robin's Blessing and stuff like that. He was, he was insanely entertaining. And the most difficult show to ever board up, I've ever board up because there's no schedule. There's no, it's not like, <laughs> like, like guys and I, when we would prep the show, it would be set for three o'clock, three fifteen, three thirty, three forty five. Now, did if three forty five hit and we were still talking, would I go, no, stop everything? No, but you, you kind of had an idea where you're going. He start going. And if he blew through two commercial stop sets that were supposed to be, you know, let's say five minutes long each. You'd have a 15-minute commercial stop set come up, and it was running on a minute and 15-second delay, and that's all you knew. So you'd be sitting there, and you'd hear K-Rock, and you'd hit, because he was on K-Rock out of the city, 92.3, which always confused the hell out of me because the fly. And you'd hit like hit the timer, and then a minute and 15 seconds later, you'd pot him down, you'd pot up your commercials, you'd run your commercials. And then you'd be listening, you'd hear K-Rock, and you'd do the same thing the other way. That was the only way you knew. There'd be mornings... I would be like, I'm going to pee my pants today. Today's the day I wet my pants in the studio because he's not going to go to break. Like, and you'd be out, you know, you're in there at like four o'clock in the morning, get ready. And you're out till two. <laughs> and then he doesn't go to break. And it's like, I just, I might more than pee my pants. <laughs> this could get bad. But it was, he's legitimately king of all media. He can interview anyone. He can interview, interview anyone. And if they were willing to have an open and honest conversation, it would be a great conversation. They should play the movie Private Parts in media classes. Love it. Because a lot of people, even though you mentioned like missing breaks is not always a big deal, <laughs> there are some program directors, bosses of stations, that if you miss it by 90 seconds, especially at the top of the hour, they will oh. start yelling and screaming and banging on the window and Stern, go watch Private Parts because he just does what he wants and that's the power of how popular he was that even if you were a sponsor – and you were an advertiser that said, I'm on the Howard Stern show, you didn't care you were in a 10-minute commercial break no. because people were flipping on Stern and the audience was so massive, it didn't matter. You were still getting the airtime and the exposure you wanted. They would, they would do, um, like, local places would do live reads with them. And I think they would pay, like, an obscene, like, $1,000 for one. So, like, you'd pay, like, a, like a, let's just say $1,000. He would do it. But you, as the board op, had to record it on reel to freaking reel. So like <laughs> like a giant cassette tape in the room. And if you missed it, it was gone. It was in the ether. You had to hope that somebody at K-Rock would send it to you. Because somebody paid $1,000 for that thing. And then you take it off the reel to reel. You'd give it to your, it was, guys, Tim Stokes. He was our prod guy. RIP Tim Stokes. Why is everybody gone? How have I made it this far? Um, he's one of the greatest dudes. Biggest voice you ever heard. And you give it to him and he'd load it in. And then that would run for that company for like months. But they, it was, it was like a grand. They had to pay a grand for him to do it once. And like, if he didn't get to it during the show, at the end of the show, you would hear like a uh, Albany stay on. Like after, like you'd hear it through the queue. Albany stay on. All right, Howard, uh, feed this one. And they would just do them. And you had again, like, can you imagine if you just that's when you went to pee? You and missed somebody, that. And it never went on once. Oh. And, it, and then they definitely don't have it at K Rock because it never went over the air. It was, it was so stupid, stressful for something that was so much fun, like. I remember when Jeff the Drunk first started calling in. Because Jeff the Drunk's local. Like, everybody thinks Jeff the Drunk is, like, like a made-up person. He used to be the nicest guy on the planet. If power went out in 103.5 land, he would call and ask to be put on hold so he could listen to the show on hold. And then he got on a show, like, once, and all of a sudden he was like, Listen, you jerk! He would call up and this, You're an asshole! And, this, and he would go off on you. <laughs> and, like, uh, Casey Armstrong had to, like, Call me one day. He goes, I need him to record some stuff. Can he come in and record stuff? And I'm like, yeah, of course. Whatever you guys need. Can you give him $50? He needs $50. I'm like, uh, yeah. I, he goes, I'll, I, will, I will FedEx you $50 if you just give him $50. So I literally had to give him 50 bucks, record, Jeff the truck is just assholes. And like, 
then he leaves, and the next day there's a FedEx envelope with a fifty dollar bill in it. But that's like like that was the that was the job, whatever they needed, whenever they needed. So there's a part of me that like wishes I had the outtakes of it. Oh, oh I wasn't drunk enough here. Let's reset that, please. <laughs> no, that was, he was never sober. <laughs> My dude likes to drink. That's all, right. all there is to it. So you're in the middle of this Howard Stern era, which is golden era of radio. Oh, so you're much a fun. part of it. You're on the air now at this point. This is you. I actually skipped over this. It's really important. When you talk about that live on location stuff, that's one of the dream jobs. It's oh. more part time now. You might be a promotions director in some markets, but Levac, at that point in your life, you're going to all the parties, all the biggest shows. Yeah. You're going to everything. But there introing is- bands over at Northern Lights, which Upstate Concert Hall. I I got paid to go drink. I yes. literally got paid to drink. You're having all these amazing moments, but there is a transition now from your career from rock to country. Well, I, well, I ended up 7 to midnight on on the edge, and when Stern left, you know, was it, AHS, after Howard Stern? Yeah. We became Q1057. I was on nights. I was, I was the assistant program director, but I was the program director of, at that point, it was 1300 AM, which was 104.5 The Team Now. And when the, they made me the program director when they flipped it. So I was the guy behind the scenes who loaded the whole station, and that's when I knew I wanted to talk sports, and they wouldn't let me. That was when I knew I wanted. So I, had the, I was the night show host. I was APD of, of Q103 at that time, and I was the PD of 104.5, the team. So by they not letting you, was that because they felt like you had more value behind the scenes because you knew all this stuff? Was it because they didn't know what they were going to do with sports? Did you not? I, I'm confused. I, I'm, I'm right. sure I'm with a lot of people who hear that. It's like, what? <laughs> what, they, what? So – it was, I think it was kind of, it was like, it was like twofold at that point. I found out later it was like threefold, but originally it was, I was doing so much on Q that they didn't want to lose that. But the other part was like corporate had had a lot of success in other markets. And at this point were regent communications um, by bringing in like newscasters, athletes, stuff like that. And that's when they brought in Brian Sinkoff. And it was, I helped launch sound off with Sinkoff, which Brian did for years with Alan Fish and did a good job with that. And then once that got going, that was when I found out what the third fold was. There was a very important person in the building who had always wanted me on his show. And that was one of the other reasons I didn't get to be entrenched anywhere else is because eventually everybody knew I was going to end up, everybody but me knew I was going to end up on a different show. Well, let's do it. Can we talk about that person? Sean McMaster. Can we talk about Sean? Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll do this with Sean <laughs> Sean well. and Richie. Yep. Look, we talked about Bob as being a Campbell Region legend. I would love to talk to Sean. Oh. not trying to scoot over this interview. Like, you know <laughs> well, I'm fine. Talking? I'm going to go. Just... We'll get McMaster <laughs> in here then. We're talking about another guy who here in the Campbell Region has carved out truly one of the most amazing careers in all of New York yeah. State. And we talked about Hall of Famers. Uh, Sean's ballot's probably got to get pushed to the Hall of Fame oh, very Sean. soon. If, it, if he's not, if he, if he's not in the second, like I don't know, I don't know how eligibility works. I don't know if you have to be off the air for a little while or something. That's just stupid. If he's not in, so it's just stupid. I don't feel jealous asking this question as a former radio partner of yours. Let's talk about another radio relationship you had with Sean McMaster <laughs> and what it was like working with him. Dude, he was my guy. Like in the beginning, I tried to quit a couple times. He would take me out to lunch, and he'd be like, "You can't quit. You have talent. You can't quit. You have something that that." A lot of people don't have. You, you just can't quit. So that prick kept me in radio. for no, um, <laughs> So like we, we were really close friends. We would go out. We would hang out. We would do stuff. Um, and then it just never looked like it was going to work because, like, yeah, who wants, who wants to get up at, like, 3.30 in the morning? I had a kid, you know, and do all that. And I was going through a divorce. Who wants to do all that? Well, obviously I did because it ended up happening. And, uh, I yeah, I went over. I became the producer slash third chair for Sean and Richie. Again, for outside people of the Capital Region who may not know, that show, number one in the market, the number yeah. one show in oh, Albany. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. I'll, Revenue ratings. Jenny's a monster every, here. Every once in a while, it would get, like, like in political seasons, like, like GY would, would knock it down. Or uh, everyone, like, there'd always be, like, a random book in the summer where Fly would get it. But day in and day out, WGNA was the station. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, not to make you jealous, never worked for a station that was more fun than that station. Simply because beautiful women listen to country music. <laughs> that was so much fun. It was like, like I love each and every one of you dudes who comes up to me in Cumberland Farms. Is like, what's up, man? Good show, whatever. That's awesome. But when you're at like, you know, SPAC and some really hot chick you have, you should not have a chance with comes up and goes, what are you doing later? And it's like, <laughs> you. And they're like, okay. And it's like, oh my God, that worked. Oh my God. That's GNA. That's what GNA was. So do you find yourself when you're working a three? And again, for younger students who are listening, they probably might have. Yeah, please first- don't. <laughs> <laughs> None of this is going to work now. <laughs> their first opportunity could be a three, though, like coming in and doing updates if those yeah. are still things in the future. 
Did you find yourself putting more pressure on yourself as the three in comparison to later in your career as the one or the two? And I'm talking about the first voice you hear, a partner. Because when you're the three, you got to always be on. Like, you're coming on to basically bring the comedy, bring the entertainment. And if you're not good, it's almost like a stand-up set. Like, you got to like kind of walk the shame off. Like, oh, man, I suck there. <laughs> like, you only get a small limit. Did you ever feel that when you were working that role? No, because th that was, like, Richie had no ego. Like you, like Richie is still one of my best friends in the world. And Sean, Sean has all the ego in the world, but he's also one of the nicest guys. Like he, he's completely misunderstood maybe by himself, but he is like, neither one of those guys ever once said, don't talk. Neither one of those guys ever once like said, well, you ruined that break. It was always like, we would always turn into a joke if somebody screwed it up. So it was, it was just fun. Like I, like I remember some of the funny jokes. Like I remember there was a dude who <laughs> you get the prep service in the morning, the kicker news, right? Which is fun, like funny. News. Some dude gets arrested while driving and having relations with a jar of pasta sauce. <laughs> That's that was the news. And and we never and you know this now, I don't I like to be off the cuff. Like that's where my humor is. Like if we prep it, I'll blow it. You know what I mean? So I put the stories in front of Sean. He wouldn't tell me what story. He wouldn't tell Richie what story we we're going to read. When we we're going to do it, he does the story. And I just react. And he goes, yeah, so the guy's driving the road, and he's blah, blah, And I go, it's in there, because that was the old pasta. <laughs> and the whole show stops. <laughs> Richie turns a shade of red I've never seen in my life, leaves the room. Sean like almost throws up and that was like, but that was, that was the fun we were having. And we would, and we would go out, we would, we'd host, you know, name the show. We Darius Rucker's in our fantasy football league. He's paying us 150 bucks to play fantasy football with us. <laughs> Not just like, Hey man, you want to play like whatever? He's like, well, dude, it's a $150 league. And he's like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's like, that's, that's what that team, that's that show, that, that team, that broadcast team was. And even though you're a sports fan all the way through, this is kind of your first exposure to doing sports updates on the air. Cause I want to yeah. make sure I get this right. Is it views from the couch? You're going to kill me because yeah, I missed Jeff it. Jeff Levac's view from the couch. All right. I got it right. All right. What yeah. was that for those who – maybe it was one of your favorite segments. I bet you still get compliments on I it still, to this day. Yeah. <laughs> there's, it's always weird. Like, I was <laughs> – we were doing a um, LePage's marking round in front of and some guy walked by, and he's like, oh, yeah, I don't I, – I haven't listened to radio since the edge. I'm like, oh, Levac. He goes, oh, I love that guy. I'm like, that's, that's me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, and, and he's like, nah, nah, nah. But, like, yeah, the uh, – <laughs> Richie – I come in fired out of a cannon every morning. That's who I was. I was fired up. And Sean would go, like, leave me alone. And Richie would be like, okay, all right, I'll humor you because I'm nice. This so one day I come in, and I'm like, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. He goes, and Sean's like, he just puts his hand up like a, like, a, like a crossing guard, like, stop. He goes, can you put together three minutes of just solid sports content? I go, absolutely. So I go in the room, I write it. I go, here. And he goes, I don't want to see it. And he fires over me. Well, Richie hears the conversation and instantly in his head writes a jingle. So like by the time, so Sean doesn't know Richie's got a jingle. Neither one know if I got anything good. And Sean goes, all right, we're going to go to the back. And Richie's like, no, no, no. It's Jeff Lovac with sports, beer, sandwiches, and other life essentials. And like a beer opening. <laughs> and like we got complaints from like old house frows about the burp. But like, yeah, we did it. And then we did it every day. Every, every single day I would have some random like three stories, some stupid thing I wrote or whatever. And it was a blast. And, and yeah, it, it, that's probably what got me into seeing what the A's were, like the top stories. But it was like, <laughs> I remember like my biggest compliment when women would come to me and be like, I now know what they're talking about at the water cooler. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know if I know what they're talking about at the water cooler, but it's cool. Thanks. That comment right there about women giving you compliments. This is a very deep radio answer. And I hopefully, again, this is helpful for some people who enter the more entertainment side of this. The mornings on music stations is a heavier listen to women audience. Yeah. So it's just like a country station. It's yeah, country yeah. station for sure. Where they actually, this is going to sound weird. I don't think I'm making a judgment on this. At times, Women listening to other women talk, they don't like the other no. woman. So like, they did a study on that. Yeah. They literally did. It was, it, was, it was an interesting time for country, too, because they did a study on that where, like, when we had Casey Dan doing our news. She was great. Um, yeah, women wouldn't listen to other women. And then the, the really interesting thing that started to happen, like, right when I got into country music, which you wouldn't even believe now, you used, like, for country, gay was a punchline. 
ever you make fun of gay guys all day long because it was funny. Well, what ended up happening like while we were they did a, they did a full study. I remember being like kind of proud. They said uh, what has happened is the P ones like your number one listeners who used to think that was hysterical now have gay kids, mm. and now their gay kids are P ones. So now they're these you know the you know, here we are in Pride Month right, and it's you if you want to alienate your audience, go ahead. Say, say something derogatory about gay people just for the fun of it. And it was like, it was one of those moments, like there's people very close to me in my life and I, it's not my job to out them. So who are, who happen to be, you know, gay, lesbian and everything. And, uh, I remember going like, Oh my God, we are, we, we are growing up. And now we've gone way too far. Now you can't joke about anything, but, but we're, we're growing and it was a cool thing. But yeah. So like women, and that's also the money demo, 25, 54 female, because in most households, that's who controls the wallet. And this is where this like collision, this friction comes with me because knowing that information, you knowing that information, WGNA decides to make a change with you, even <laughs> though you're popular with women. Why? I, I know the answer. You know the answer. <laughs> but somebody listening is probably like, how the hell did they ever get LeVac off of that station? There, was, um, there were two people who hated me. And it just so happened those two people were in a decent position of power. One was the operations manager for the building, which operations manager oversees the entire building on the programming side. And the other was a consultant for the station. And I was there, quote, too locker roomy for the show. Women didn't like me. I was too locker roomy. So they slowly but surely, you know, soured me with, you know, people who could, who could make the decision to take me off the air. And they did. And I was off the air for... Jeez, I want to say it was like four months. I know it was a lot of weight. I put on some weight during that time. But, yeah, I was off. I was off. I was, they couldn't fire me because everyone knew how hard I worked. But they took me off the radio. They took me off GNA because it was a woman's station and I wasn't women friendly. That is the most difficult part of your career because, like you just said, you hear the talent. Well, the last couple weeks haven't been easy. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just laugh about that, by the way. Uh, so, so that four-month period, though, did you think you were done with radio? Like, did you think that was Yeah, the there was a couple times where I thought, and that was another time where, like, even though it was, there was nothing he could do, Sean took me out again. You know, we went out, we had, we had lunch, and we talked, and he's like, you can't quit. You can't, you can't let these people be the ones that end your career. And I, I got really, really lucky at that point because I just, you know, nose to the grindstone, worked as hard as I could, and the guy across the hall ends up being one of my best friends. And he's the one who gets me back on the air. Look at us. We still have the chemistry. You didn't say his name. You didn't say how. We still know what we're doing, my friend, because that's a nice radio tease we set it up for. We're going to pause right okay. here. You right. and I are going to get another beer. I'm out of beer. Yeah, yeah we're both out, out of beer. Yeah. So we're going to pause this. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify or wherever it might be, this is going to be part one of the episode ending. Part two will be out later this week. Levac and I need another beer. And we still have the chemistry. We both knew without yes, even saying it. I could sense it. it. I could sense we it. We were going to go to break. So, all right, let's get ready for part two. We'll grab another beer. We'll be back.